Daisy Miller, Portrait or Prototype of the Modern Woman. Well, said Winterborne, when you deal with natives, you must go by the custom of the place. Flirting is a purely American custom. It doesn't exist here. So when you show yourself in public with Mr. Giovanelli and without your mother, gracious. Thus is an exchange between the protagonist Winterborne and the titular Daisy Miller, a young American woman of means vacationing with her mother and brother through Europe. Join us today as we explore Henry James's Daisy Miller, the popularity of the novella, and the use of her character as an archetype to define a certain kind of American woman. I'm your host, Elena. Now please, sit back and enjoy today's edition of Lit Tips. As one of Henry James's earlier works, Daisy Miller is a unique little story that examines the correlation of expectations, manners, and gender norms from behind a Europeanized lens. Daisy Miller was such a hit that it made James a literary celebrity both in Europe and in North America. But even after such masterpieces as The Portrait of a Lady and Turn of the Screw, James seemed unable to get out from under the long shadow of Daisy Miller. It had struck such a chord among clashing old world and new world positions, highlighting a certain kind of woman, that it stimulated a universal debate about the true intentions of his famous heroine. Was Daisy Miller a harmless flirt or a filthy harlot? From the comfort of today's vantage point, Daisy almost seems plainly innocent. Before we dive deeper into Daisy Miller, we recommend that you get your hands on the Penguin's Classics Edition with the introduction by David Lodge. Lodge does an exceptional job dissecting not only the work, but the author in far greater detail than we have time for in this video. Daisy Miller was first written in 1878 and updated by an older and more seasoned Henry James in 1909. With a little over 30 years between the two works, some have said the novella was reworked to fit James' more mature, later works. However, Lodge himself argues that the updates that James had made consequently removed ambiguity that was part of what made the original draft so alluring. As Lodge puts it, Although the 1879 text is shorter, sparer, and stylistically simpler than the 1909 text, it is paradoxically richer in meaning. But the meaning inheres as much in what is implied as in what is stated. One might almost say that in Daisy Miller, James anticipated Ernest Hemingway's theory of the short story, that you could omit anything if you knew what you omitted, and the omitted part would strengthen the story and make people feel something more than they understood. That seems to make sense enough. A story that over-examines or over-contextualizes certain features or scenes doesn't permit the reader as much leeway to pull their own meaning and therefore establish their own connection to the story. Henry James writes in his preface for the 1909 version of how he came up with the germ that spawned the story of Daisy Miller. And just in case you didn't know, the term germ was used by James when referring to ideas. Imagine an idea germinating, growing, and adapting into a full-fledged work that's capable of standing on its own. Here's how the germ for Daisy Miller began. It was in Rome during the autumn of 1877. A friend, then living there, happened to mention, which she might perfectly not have done, some simple and uninformed American lady of the previous winter, whose young daughter, a child of nature and of freedom, accompanying her from hotel to hotel, had picked up by the wayside, with the best conscience in the world, a good-looking Roman, a vague identity, astonished at his luck, yet so far as might be by the pair, all innocently, all serenely exhibited and introduced. This at least till the occurrence of some small social check, some interrupting incident, of no great gravity or dignity, and which I forget. There is much from this germ that James retained in his publication two years later. Let's break it down. There was an American lady vacationing with her daughter. The daughter was a child of nature and of freedom, or otherwise a woman of a new generation who bucked the status quo. Her daughter formed a companionship with an Italian man. Interject Winterborne, a possible surrogate for James himself and a cast of Europeanized American characters like Mrs. Costello and Mrs. Wallace, 
And this episode becomes a portrait about the new modern American woman and her questionable values. Daisy Miller is set in two European cities, Vevey, Switzerland, and Rome, Italy, across two distinct time periods, months apart. The novella is told through the narrative perspective of Frederick Winterborn, an American who has fully accepted the norms of the old world European society. Winterborn has become accustomed to frustrating distance between European women and himself. Keep in mind, this was during a time when dating required the presence of a rational adult, like your aunt or grandmother. So it's only natural that Winterborn was attracted to not only the beauty of Daisy Miller upon first meeting her in Vevey, but also her accessibility. However, Daisy is hardly accessible to Winterborn. Daisy is always just outside his grasp, close enough to attract, but constantly rebuffing him for his stiffness or conservative comportment. Daisy is vacationing with her little brother, Randolph, and mother, Mrs. Miller. The Millers are from Schenectady, New York, and if you trust her little nine-year-old brother, he alludes to a vast wealth on more than one occasion. Winterborn notices almost immediately how talkative Daisy is, and remember, this is completely alien to him, and he's quickly taken by such an oddity. The way in which James balances out the narrative with the inner workings of Winterborn places the reader into a unique headspace where he expresses the norms of proper society while simultaneously rendering Daisy's conduct in a way to satisfy fully Europeanized Americans like his aunt, Mrs. Costello, who rebukes Daisy for ignorance and shamelessness all the same. In his pursuit of Daisy, Winterborn attempts to gain Mrs. Costello's approval to meet Daisy before he accompanies her to the Chateau de Chillon, but she refuses. On their outing to the Chateau de Chillon, Winterborn tips the janitor extra for privacy, but unfortunately, Daisy is unimpressed, and quite honestly, a bit of an ugly American. The outing doesn't go well, and Winterborn informs Daisy that he must depart for Geneva the following day, which news Daisy doesn't take well. She brushes him off, but mentions that he should visit her in Rome. Months later, he yearns to pay her a visit, but decides to see his friend Mrs. Walker first. Winterborn finds that Daisy, her mother, and her little brother are already being received by Mrs. Walker. In fact, she and Daisy seem to be well acquainted, as Daisy tells rather blithely of her new Roman companion, Mr. Giannavelli. When she tells of an outing she has planned with Giovanelli that afternoon, Winterborn insists on accompanying her. This leads to a gentlemanly standoff between the well-dressed, handsome, although according to Winterborn and his ilk, faux gentleman whose interest is wedding a beautiful girl with means. The scene of the three is broken up by Mrs. Walker. An unwed woman walking the streets of Rome with two men on either side was simply scandalous and too much for the city to handle. Word was already spreading of Daisy Miller and her uncouth behavior. Mrs. Walker demands that Daisy get in her wagon at once, but Daisy refuses. When Mrs. Walker loses her temper and informs Daisy what the Roman society thinks of her, Daisy still refuses to budge and outright rejects a society that would see her in such a way. Mrs. Walker essentially forces Winterborn to get in the buggy, which she begrudgingly does. Like his aunt, Mrs. Costello, Mrs. Walker angrily rebukes Daisy and her mother, affirming that they should abide by the norms of the society in which they are residing. The last time Winterborn sees Daisy Miller is in the Colosseum one night. She's with Giovanelli, and they appear intimate. Winterborn attempts to leave without being noticed, but is spotted by Daisy. She chides him until he angrily calls Giovanelli out for taking Daisy to such a place where she had the risk of contracting Roman fever, malaria endemic to the streets of Italy circa 19th century. Giovanelli insists that it was Daisy who wanted to go, and he was only escorting her. Daisy soon after catches the Roman fever. After a short battle, she makes her mother promise to deliver a message to Winterborn, subtly showing her affections for him over that of Giovanelli. Then she dies. So what did women of the time think of Daisy Miller? Younger women who were more flirtatious and dressed a certain way became known as Daisy Millers. 
Like today, the portrait of Daisy Miller articulated poetically the prototype of the modern American woman. But there was a force that pushed back against this new kind of woman. English novelist and journalist Eliza Lynn Linton, she once argued progressive values of women's rights during a time when women served as second-class citizens. However, by the 1860s, she did a complete 180, and in the Saturday Review, claimed how there was a decline in values when women must return to traditional roles of wife, mother, and housekeeper. Linton went on to write how contemporary women desired to imitate the demimonde, a term derived from the French play Le Demimonde by Alexandre dumas fils published in 1955. What's of particular note is how the play involves the marriage of elite women and men and the pleasure they seek outside its institution. The term was used to label prostitutes, but was quickly attributed to contemporary women viewed as hedonistic, or trying to buck traditional norms. Linton alludes to as much in one of her articles, The Girl of the Period. When referring to women who imitate the demimonde by wearing revealing clothes, she writes, she cannot be made to see that modesty of appearance and virtue indeed ought to be inseparable, and that no good girl can afford to appear bad under pain of receiving the contempt awarded to the bad. To the credit of Henry James, he wrote a scorching yet unsigned review of Linton's work for the nation, where he reasoned, the whole indictment represented by this volume seems to us perfectly irrational. It is impossible to discuss and condemn the follies of modern women apart from those of modern men. When James relocated to London in the 1870s, he soon found himself making the acquaintance of Linton. Luckily, she wasn't a reader of the nation, not that she would have known that James was the writer behind the haughty critique of her work. Ironically, afflicted by the nature of Daisy Miller as the fictional Mrs. Walker, Linton wrote to James to try and understand the intentions of his heroine. Did you mean us to understand that Daisy went on in her mad way with Giovanelli, just in defiance of public opinion, urged thereto by the opposition made in the talk she excited, or because she was simply too innocent, too heedless, and too little conscious of appearance to understand what people made such a fuss about, or indeed the whole bearing of the fuss altogether? Was she obstinate and defying, or superficial and careless? Now, if you consider the artist's intention for their work, you may find solace in Henry James's response. Poor little DM was, as I understand her, above all things innocent. It was not to make a scandal, or because she took pleasure in a scandal, that she went on with Giovanelli. She was a flirt, a perfectly superficial and unmalicious one, and she was very fond, as she announced at the outset, of gentleman society. In Giovanelli, she got a gentleman who to her, uncultivated perception was a very brilliant one, all to herself, and she enjoyed his society in the largest possible measure. When she found that this measure was thought too large by other people, especially by Winterbourne, she was wounded. She became conscious that she was accused of something of which her very comprehension was vague. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Lit Tips. As always, hit that like button if you like what we're doing. Subscribe for more videos on literature from your favorites to the plain obscure. Hit that bell if you want to be notified when videos drop and leave a comment with your thoughts on this video along with suggestions for any books or authors you'd like us to cover in future episodes. Until next time, keep reading.